everyone to Kanek and Alak. My name is uh, Srinivas Lassman, and I'm an associate faculty at the Robotics Institute, and I'm one of the co-chairs of ICCP. So it's great to have you all here. Uh, this is a fantastic venue, as we've been seeing the last two, three years or so. Uh, we wanted to bring in people from a variety of different areas, not just vision or graphics, but optics, sensing, hardware, uh, you know, medical engineering, and so on. And uh, you know, some of the talks that we have here, especially the invited talks, reflect the breadth of the areas that uh, imaging has been really uh, uh, impactful. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, the first speaker. Uh, the first keynote speaker uh, is Elon Murbaksh, who is an associate professor at uh, robotics as well. And uh, Elon got his PhD from Stanford in 96. Uh, he leads the uh, Center for Innovative uh, robotics and is the director of uh, community robotics education and technology empowerment uh, in, in uh, CMU. What I want to say about Ela is that you know he's done amazing work, but one sentence I want to say is Ela brings in robotics to the society and tries to get the society involved in robotics. And I think uh, all of his research has shown significant societal impact. And uh, this latest incarnation in the Gigaband, and I'm sure uh, all of you have visited the Gigaband. Thank you. Well, thank you to Srinivas and to the organizers for giving me a chance to talk. It's an honor to be here uh, at this conference. And I've been quite excited about this for several months since you invited me. So it's, it's, it's great to see the day arrive. I'm going to start by giving you a bit of motivation. And some of you may have seen the article in Nature uh, in May of 2010, just last year, about the broader impact statement in the NSF applications that we all write. You know, we're supposed to write about intellectual merit. We're supposed to write about broader impact. Nature's point was, People are completely confused about broader impact. They don't know what exactly broader impact means and how to accomplish it and how to even verbalize something that they can actually accomplish in the research. So in fact, broader impact turns out to be a piece of research that is the core of what we do. So the lab the, that Srinivas described, the CREATE lab, our mission in fact has to do with broader impact. And we spend an equal amount of money and energy on the question of accomplishing broader impact as we do on the technology innovation process itself. And they feed each other because as you can imagine, if you're actually aiming to have broader impact and try and define what that means, then you're gonna design technologies that empower people in a way that is impactful. And so the project I'm gonna talk about now is one of many projects that are fundamentally about impact in society, uh, but that lead to really interesting technical technology innovations along the way in the path that you take there. And that story for this project begins at Mars. And it begins with uh, NASA Ames where a research group, including Randy Sargent, who's here in the audience today, was developing visualization technologies that allowed panoramas taken by the Mars exploration rovers to be stitched and shown and viewed and explored by the scientists who were looking at Mars, looking for signs of xenobiological evidence or signs of water on Mars, for example, or looking to understand the geologic formations on Mars. Now, what they were doing, which was interesting and which got us really going, was that Randy and company noticed that the image to them was not documentary evidence recalling some experience. It wasn't a picture of them and their grandchildren at Disneyland that fills you with an emotional response. The picture was actually a source of inspired exploration. So in looking at the picture and deciding where to zoom in and where to look within that picture, they were doing science. And the science was active with explicit decisions about where to look in the picture, and therefore the resolution of the image itself was beyond what you could look at in a single shot and make decisions about scientific uh, import. Instead, you had to decide where to zoom in and where to attend. So in a way, looking at the picture and exploring the picture was like looking at a wetland and exploring the wetland. And that shift in thought, thinking about extremely high resolution imagery as itself a source of science decision and science exploration, means that your relationship to the image changes. The image now contains hidden detail. It contains knowledge and structures that you don't know yet. And it's your interaction with that as you explore it actively that allows you to yield new results. So that was where this concept came from, that perhaps the intentional ability to explore an image is something to be emphasized. And if we can add enough resolution, can you have broad impact on society through explorable imagery? Now, the best picture with which you can start to tell the story is, of course, a famous picture, a picture of our own planet. It's not ironic that the best, most famous picture on the moon, Apollo missions, is a picture of Earth, <laughs> even though they were on the moon. 
because Earth has to us deep cultural meaning, right? And it's the ultimate explorable picture because you're here on this planet, super zoomed in right now, and yet you can zoom out and see the entire Earth. And it's also uh, well known as you talk to astronauts, as we have done time and again, they always talk about the experience of zooming out, going to space and then coming back to the Earth as changing their sense of relationship to the Earth. So that explorability that it yields to them to see the whole Earth as one unit changes their mentality about the Earth itself in a sociological, or geographic, or environmental context. And obviously there's many quotes to that effect from every astronaut that's been in space. But I'll go to the first astronaut since we're uh, three days away from the 50th anniversary of space flight. So Yuri Gagarin said that just as well as everybody else has since then. This concept that they go into space, they zoom out, and then when they zoom in, they feel differently about it. So explorability of the image, right, and our ability with our visual cortex to understand explorability and to use that to build a model <coughs> for what matters to us, that really has impact on us, and it can have this, you know, lifelong impact on the decisions we make about the planet we live on. Now, our proposal and our pitch was, let's combine that kind of explorability with deep cultural meaning. And so Randy and I made a presentation to Google and to National Geographic pitching this idea. What if we create a project, and in, in fact we did, with NASA, National Geographic, Google, and Carnegie Mellon. The project ideal was, what if we can use explorable imagery to have people develop a much deeper, more authentic understanding of the Earth, both in terms of cultures on the Earth and in terms of uh, environmental processes. So people, sociology of people, and sociology of animal and plant kingdoms. So is there a way in which explorable imagery can fundamentally change and, and uniquely alter our view of the Earth because of our empowerment to actively explore. So that's where it started. And the easy way to begin that, and the interesting first project, and the reason National Geographic was there, was Keyhole was just getting sold to Google at the time. And so that was, there you have it, right? You have an explorable planet, except when you zoom in, it gets fuzzy. And so we were wondering, well, how do we refine that image? And we weren't thinking in terms of pixel redefinition, we were thinking in terms of cultural redefinition, so cultural refinement. And so National Geographic and Time Life are probably the two sources in the world of the most interesting information about a specific place, spatially located, right? Pictures and articles about a place and a people. And so we approached one of them, National Geo, and they said yes, which was fantastic. And so indeed, the first project was really taking Google Earth and layering it with geolocated information, pictures, and narration from National Geographic articles, from archival articles. So now you're zooming into the Earth and then spatially organized your yielding and surfacing cultural information about people and pictures that photographers have taken that are award-winning pictures because they're National Geographic photographers. And so that was exciting, right? Because what you're doing is creating a sense of resolution, in this case, cultural resolution, anthropomorphic resolution, anthropocentric resolution. But there's a problem. The problem is that project, albeit very successful, and this was one of the first layers that we were able to demonstrate, and it was a public layer on Google Earth for many years. Um, now there's a lot of layers on Google Earth, so the idea of layers has caught on beautifully. But the, the fundamental issue with that project was, if we're talking about community empowerment, then it can't simply be about people actively exploring. It needs to be about people actively authoring, actively creating. So the question you ask is, could we imagine a world in which anybody can make that image? Can we imagine a world in which you take Google Earth and you go on vacation to San Francisco El Alto in Guatemala and you create a very high resolution panorama of the open air market? So that now you and your friends and everybody else in the world can zoom in to that poor resolution satellite map of San Francisco El Alto, but then you can zoom in and actually see so much detail about the open air market that you can tell stories about it. That you can talk about the fact that the fellow has a rope on his head because that's how they carry heavy things. That you can talk about the fact that the woman who has the bag on her head without using her hands comes from an indigenous line because the indigenous line in Guatemala can do that. And the more local, uh, immigrants can't. And so you start to be able to get at the cultural artifacts, but fundamentally, can we get there through the authorship by the public, for public consumption? That was the challenge that really started the Gigapan project. But there's four huge problems that you have to solve to nail that. And the first one is already really hard. You have to be able to capture billions of pixels. But you can't just capture them, you have to capture them cheaply, right? This can't be an 80 megapixel back leaf camera. That's not gonna work for people. They don't have the insurance policies. They don't have the know-how technically to take those images. So how do you allow anybody to capture the imagery easily from a backpack quickly? That's one big problem. Then there's another problem. If we want people to do this broadly, 
We can't depend on them being people who have used Photoshop or even more advanced tools than Photoshop to do stitching. We can't assume they know what sift is. We can't assume that they know what the phrase least squares means. So these can't be people who necessarily understand, well, let's see, do I want orthographically equal rectangular projections? We're talking about the public. So somehow the process of stitching has to go from something that you do in a tuned fashion with a great deal of human input during stitching to something highly automatic. And there's another problem, which is this projection problem, right? You'd think that there's sort of one projection that's always right, and the sad answer is it's just not true. And I'll, I'll show you a little example just to get you thinking about that a little bit. Um, a picture that was just uh, uploaded, I think, two days ago to the Gigapan website is a picture from Béziers, which is a town in southern France near Toulouse. <coughs> and is it dark? Yeah, it's dark up there, but you get kind of the idea. It's a 360 panorama of, uh, what's it called? It's uh, Le Galerie de Magasin. And it's a sort of dead place right now. And you can explore it and look at it, and you can see that the orthographic projection here has done some really interesting warping on top, right? Because this picture included things at the North Pole. And we had to stretch it out to fit it on this flat screen that I'm, I'm showing this to you on. And often, the flat screen is a fabulous way to show a picture. But when I look at this picture and zoom around it, the feeling I get is one of some space, right? There's some space, and I can kind of imagine the space. But the feeling you'll get of the exact same picture, if we view it in Google Earth, where Gigapan is sending the image files and then showing them in a spherical projection, is utterly different. And it's fascinating how different of a feel you will get as I explore that space. It's the same exact picture, okay? But now it feels like a narrow hallway. You feel more intimate with the area and with that big plastic bag there on the ground. And you can look up and see the beautiful blue sky. So this changes the feeling that you have about the space, all because of the way you're interactively exploring a particular projection. It's a totally different place from that first place. It's much more intimate. So in a way, the, the challenge and the interesting bit of what I want to explain, <coughs> everything matters. If we're talking about human experience, how we project it, how we stitch it, the way it looks to us, all of this is incredibly important to the human experience we create, the rhetoric, and how compelling the rhetoric of the image is. Then there's the problem of storage and server architecture. Um, even if people were to do labors of love and create these images on a local computer, they end up with a very large file. And at best, maybe they can put it on one of these and send it to their friend. But they're certainly not going to send it over the internet, and they're certainly not going to attach it to an email message. It would be hilarious to do so. It could be 10 billion pixels. The one I just showed you was a billion pixels of Bézier. So you need a place to store these, and you need a way to serve them efficiently to millions of people around the world. And then finally, if you want people to explore these, you also want people to annotate these. So you need in a crowdsourced way for people to be able to look at these extreme imagery and then annotate them, create new content on top of them, human content that you can then search later and, and find. And so in a way, you have to solve all four of these problems simultaneously. And if you solve only two or three of them, you don't end up with a system that allows authentic public authorship. And that was a big problem that we had going into this. Now I'll tell you a little bit about a couple of these and we'll move on to some new stuff and, and talk about science applications. But first of all, on the hardware side, the particular strategy we used was to make it inexpensive and to enable us to keep up with technological advances, design a robot that's technology agnostic, a robot that is camera agnostic. So any camera fits on it, which means you have to be able to adjust the uh, NPP, the nodal parallax point, no parallax point, so whatever you want for your particular camera. But you want to be able to readjust it next year to whatever new camera you buy. It also means if you're going to use point and shoot cameras, well, there's only one way to talk to every point and shoot camera and tell it to take a picture, the shutter button. So you're going to have to have a physical, mechanical shutter button. <laughs> it's the only way. But once you give it a finger, what that buys you is that next year when a new camera comes out that has more resolution, that has better dynamic range, you can put that exact camera on the existing robot and make it a much better system. And so that was one aspect of the strategy. The second part of the strategy is it has to be low cost even in low volumes. You know, we're not a car company that's going to build a million of anything. And therefore, you have to design mechanisms and electronics that can be designed in 50s and 100s cheaply. And that was a major aspect of getting Gigapan off the ground. Finally, usability. This comes to the equity question. If we want public authorship, you have to ask the question, whose voices are most important to listen to? Whose perspective is it that we need as a society to benefit from? And well, there's two extrema that are really good demonstrators of that. Who listens to middle school students? Nobody. 
So the voice of a middle school student, the perspective that they have visually on their space and what matters to them is exceedingly important. Indeed, they are the future and we don't listen to them. So it's kind of a double whammy. Two good reasons to listen to them. Two good reasons to make sure from a usability point of view, whatever the interface is, the UI has to be so simple that a middle schooler can use it. At the other end, you have scientists, which are equally non-geeks, by the way, as middle school students. Okay, your average anthropologist who does a fantastic job digging at Petra, Jordan, does not necessarily hack on a Ubuntu system. So it has to be so easy that not only can a middle school student use it, but a scientist can use it. Especially if you want those scientists' perspectives to come through in rhetorically compelling ways. They have to make beautiful pictures with that equipment. They can't be photographers because they're not professional photographers, and they can't be computer scientists because they're not computer scientists. And so that introduces a real challenge on the usability side. So the camera and the reason for this unit <coughs> has a lot to do with these fundamental strategies. There is, of course, a more advanced unit, harder to use, but giving you much more freedom because it has a digital connection to the camera, because it fits absurdly long, long lens DSLRs, like 800 millimeter lenses, and because you can do a lot more programming of it. Um, so, of course, eventually the need is there and you have to provide the higher end equipment as well. Now, let me just talk about stitching a little bit also. I've already talked about the idea that you need automation. And what's nice about the current stitcher is that you essentially identify the adjacency between the images and then you hit go and it does the rest. But even more important is the question of feedback. If somebody's going to take pictures in the field, they can't store 10 gigapixel panoramas worth of pictures. That's, you know, let's say 10,000 pictures. <laughs> Come back home and then stitch them one a night for 10 nights. That's just not going to work. It's not a way to provide enough feedback to people that they can take better shots in the field. And to the geologist, when they get back home, they have to write their nature article. They don't have time to spend 10 nights stitching. And so we've worked a great deal on speeding up the stitcher, thanks to Paul Heckberg, who's been working with Randy on that problem. And the current stitcher is fast enough that, in fact, it runs about as fast as the stitching at the actual capture. So if you go out and I go somewhere and I take a picture for 20 minutes, it takes about 20 minutes for me with my small computer to stitch it. And then I'm done. And that's nice, because that means in the field I can be stitching my, cam my picture taking my next shot and quickly seeing how did that turn out, what was good, what was bad, is the focus where I want. Then there's issues of quality such as vignette correction. I think that the projector is high quality enough, you can see the vignetting in this picture, right? The dark vertical bands. Um, and it's interesting because what happens is we want people to use cheap cameras, which means cheap optics. But as soon as we allow for the fact that people will use a cheap point and shoot camera, that means you have cameras that have no vignetting model built in at all. And in a single picture, that's fine. It never bothers anyone. But when we put these pictures next to each other and stitch them together, then camera qualities come to play that otherwise just wouldn't be an issue. And so, in fact, Paul worked on vignetting correction, and I'll just show you the same picture. This is a picture of Klein Hanklip, um, in the southern tip of South Africa, uh, near Cape Town. And this is the same picture with vignette correction, which is far, far better in terms of the economy of the picture. Out in the distance here is Cape Point, which is famous. And over here is another famous thing. This is the uh, R44, Clarence Drive which is, I believe, the most famous road in the world for motorcycle enthusiasts. Motorcycles love to drive on this road because it goes along the hills um, and it's really, really fast. And yes, they're driving on the other side of the road there, which makes vacationing there really interesting. You have to keep reminding yourself of that. So that's a sense of the resolution, but also a sense of how through software you can achieve some, some great advances. Here, by the way, the advance is possible because of the fact that we can take advantage of something interesting, right? We have multiple pictures of the same scene. We have multiple places of the world, right? <coughs> captured on different parts of the lens and chip. And so we can actually use that to induce a model for the vignetting of the camera and then reverse that to pull out the vignetting. So that's why such a thing becomes possible in a situation like this. So sometimes extra information is extremely useful. Now, when you start thinking about the applications and the rhetorical nature of what you can document with <coughs> systems like this, this crowdsourcing thing becomes incredibly important. This is a picture of the Vietnam War Memorial. And I took this picture and I decided to let people's, people walk in front of it as I took the picture. So you get this odd effect of people and parts of people scattered in the picture. But then the public comes through and makes comments about it. So somebody in the public comes along and says, ah, this is sort of interesting accent. It really changes the memorial when you see a head in it. Somebody else here has annotated Anthony Galino's name on the wall. What's interesting about that is that now when you do a search on Anthony Galina in gigapan.org or even on Google, you will hit spatially located, geocoded, sub-sampled <laughs> snapshot 
inside of a gigapan on the gigapan side. Which is interesting, right? Instead of an indexical representation of information, it's presenting a crowdsourced, annotated, but spatially organized sense of information. And so that changes a bit the way we can think about organizing the world. And that, to me, is something that's really quite exciting. I'll show you one other example, which is Corf Castle in Dorset. Again, to give you a sense of the usability here. So this is Corf Castle in, in, in near Dorset, as I said. And it's a really fun castle to walk, and I've, I've taken a walk up there with my family and enjoyed it. But it's also interesting to use a panorama to both view the structures in the area to see how beautiful the old stone houses are and to read all the educational signage in the area. What's exciting is that you get so much detail that you can see the caption on the sign, that you can see the pictures drawn about that place and you can read the signs. So in a way, you're also spatially co-locating information presented for the physical visitor together with the actual structures themselves. And in museums, as you can imagine, this has been heavily used now. So that again giving you a sense of what that looks like. Now, I'm going to edge into talking about use cases. And the first one to talk about is the school program. And we have somebody here who's one of the leads on our school program, Droy Aron, who's next to Randy. And the education team at Gigapan has been responsible for answering the question, how do you deploy massive numbers of Gigapans to children around the world, have them capture cultural artifacts about their world, and then share it with one another. And so those are all places, and I've lost count, so this is a partial list, but these are all places right now that there are children gigapanning their environment and then sharing it with one another. So we're starting to get a nice kind of spread. What happens, and why this is exciting, is that it causes, first of all, local conversation. And I'll come back to this again and again, even with scientists. This is a mural in Wilkinsburg, which is a very low-income neighborhood near here. It's 10 minutes away by, by car from here. And in this neighborhood, there's a beautiful mural. And the children there have no idea what the pictures of the people are, even though they're very famous people from 1920 to 1960, Pittsburgh and America. And so the challenge and, and impact of this was that the children took the gigapan and then sat down with their parents in the local YMCA. And the parents went on a spatial tour of the gigapan with the children, helping them to annotate snapshots that they took inside the gigapan. So the parents and children were together co-authoring it. And in so doing, it triggered the parents to reveal history to the children. They have conversations they'd never had before because they were in the act of writing text about it together. They were co-authoring something. So an interesting aspect of this is that you get local navel-gazing about culture, local exploration about knowledge that, that is born of that. By the same token, when you take that gigapan and you share it with students in Soweto Township and you ask the Soweto Township students to do the same thing, they know about Martin Luther King who was on that gigapan, but they don't know about Tietzi Machinini, which is an incredibly important memorial exactly where there were major uh, protests against the use of Afrikaans, forced use of Afrikaans in, in school. So they don't even know about that because they're so young that this is not part of their cultural memory. And then in taking that gigapan, annotating it, looking at the imagery in that gigapan, identifying the people in that structure, talking about who those people are and what their importance is to the history of South Africa, and then sharing that with the Americans, they too are learning about South Africa in a way that they didn't before. So this is a cliche, but the cliche is forcing you to document your world causes you to relearn the important aspects of your world. Well, guess what? Forcing you to document your world with gigapixel imagery does that even more because there's more detail. There's more to look at. There's more to write about. And so it gives you a sense of space that's very important. Then you take those same images and you share them with yet another group, in this case, girls at a girls' school uh, in Trinidad, and the Trinidadians create gigapans, and the South Africans create gigapans, and now you put on a gallery show. This is where you hit the rest of the public, because the internet buys you only ever a slice of the public. But when you print these out on large format printers, and then do an opening, a gallery opening, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, then what happens is the parents come with the students. They all look at the printouts, and then the parents feel like, my student can create <coughs> art, and they start to share conversations about those places on paper. And I can't stress the paper side of this enough. When we go to Pine Ridge, South, uh, it's an American Indian reservation right here in the US where unemployment is 90%. It's the paper form that draws the students in first. Because when you're talking about it on paper, they become physical gigapanners, right? They zoom in, they look, they touch, they feel, they back up and look with their eyes. And so they become, in fact, interactive explorers of an image that has too much resolution to look at just from one distance, even on a printout. Same story in Chad, uh, where Drawer went and they run a program where there's a local building project. You're gigapanning the building project, 
then you're going into the local town communities, the town council, and you're using the printout as a spatial way to organize a discussion about the building project and about how you can do the building project in an ecologically sustainable manner. So I'll end the education side of the talk there. Suffice it to say we believe strongly in this idea that imagery can invoke deep exploration of your own culture and deep communication between cultures. But now we come to science, and this is a picture of uh, the Dorset uh, Outreach for Science program that we ran. The way we do this is we bring 20 to 30 scientists together from diversity of fields in workshops. We've done something like six of these workshops now for 140 scientists. And in each case, we give the scientists gigapans, teach them how to use it, and then observe how it changes the way they communicate science to the public and how they document science for their own use. In this case, these scientists, when asked what they're going to do with the system, gave us this list. And in fact, they did this. Which is interesting, because what you see is everything from crime scene identification, forensics on crime scenes, to geomorphology and urban planning. Um, they even have a lot of, uh, this is near the White Cliffs of Dover, where you have dinosaur bones in the cliffs. So they even did multiple shots from boats with a gigapan of the cliff walls, because you can find dinosaur bones in the cliff walls. And the cliffs are constantly sheaving. It's really interesting stuff. That's why it's called the Jurassic Coast. So with scientists, the interesting bit becomes how does the use of the gigapixel imaging change science itself? And this is going to take us into where I'm going next. But I'll give you three examples before we go to the next step. Example number one, Jane Goodall Institute. So Jane Goodall Institute does conservation ecology, but they need money. So they want to do fundraising. So how do they do fundraising now? Well, they take a gigapan of a tobacco plantation that's illegal in Kenya where the local forest has been destroyed. And they zoom around and they show people by zooming in that plantation that the trees on the forest have all been ringed. They're all going to die. That that whole forest that looks green is about to go dead. So then they fill you with a kind of passion. Then they show you another zoomed in picture of a gorilla in the midst of that. And then they ask you for your money. And that's very effective. Um, Alex Smith, University of Guelph, does the DNA barcoding of life project. What he'll do is go in and take an ant in a particular wetland environment and DNA barcode that ant and store it in a database. And they're traveling in a van all over Canada doing this. But now what he can do is he can take that exact spot where the ant was and do a panorama from there as well. So you've captured a visual documentation of the wetland, the indigenous species and the invasive species, the seasonality criteria of the exact place where the DNA barcode was done. But you can do better than that. Then you go back to the lab and you can actually do an assay, a count of all the insects in the picture. You couldn't do that before. You had to take 15 undergraduates with you, train them on how to do the identification of the insects, and then send them out into the field and wait a while. Here you go in, you take a 10 minute gigapan, you get the DNA, and you leave. You go to the next spot. So you create a library of information, and furthermore, what if you want to go back and look for something you didn't know you were looking for a year ago? You can't go back to a year ago, can you? So that presents the fundamental problem in science. You decide what you're paying attention to. And your center of attention is a, it's a decision you can't undo because time passes. And that's a big problem. With the gigapan, with any kind of gigapixel technology, the point is that you can go back and revisit that question. This is another final example that I'll show you. Uh, this is fun because, in fact, scanning electron microscopes are a way of seeing the world at a different scale. So they are a reveal. But the reveal where we decide where to look, then we take that shot. What if we don't know where to look? What if we want to see all of the ant at full magnification? We can't do that. It's too much work. Well, a group in San Jose took the uh, robot and took the knobs off the scanner electron microscope, really. So they left the axles exposed. And they took the stepper motors in the gigapan and stuck them on the knobs with rubber tubes. You got that. <laughs> then they used the buttons on the gigapan to go top, left, bottom, right spin the knobs with the motors, the stepper motors and the gigapan. And lo and behold, they get a picture of the ant that's a gigapixel image of a single ant through a scanning electron microscope stitched together. So now what you have is the opportunistic ability to imagine later at some other date any SEM picture you wanted of that ant, of whatever portion of the ant you found interesting. So again, it changes the relationship we have to data. People think of this as big data sometimes. And the you know, popular press write about the concept of big data. This is a formal instantiation of that, right? What does gigapixel imagery buy you? Well, it buys you a certain kind of big data, and that changes the way you do science. So now we come to the final part of my talk, which will be a lot of demos. So this should keep you awake, hopefully. And this final part of the talk gets at something that we've been struggling with, 
and working on, and Randy Sargent has had a team here working on now for months. And so we're happy to kind of reveal something to you. So this is a, a, a first reveal of something exciting. The question is, what if you could take gigapans over time, right? What if you could create gigapixel imagery, the highest resolution possible, and repeatedly take that imagery and have a stack of them? Is that a time lapse? And isn't that interesting to have a time lapse, to play that in, in speeded up time or slowed down time, depending on the temporal resolution we're talking about? That feels interesting, right? But it gets even more interesting when you reconsider the fact that it's gigapixel imagery, that it's extremely high resolution. Because we're not just talking about time lapse the way planet Earth and BBC do time lapse, which shows you a particular fascinating view of a mushroom growing in a forest floor, which is beautiful. But you're a viewer. Let's go back to the original goal. We want interaction, right? We want you as not just an author, but as an observer to decide where to look. And after all, the gigapixel image has so much detail, you can't see everything that deserves to be seen in a single scale. So now what we're really talking about is stacked gigapixel imagery over time in which you can both explore the time dimension and in which you can actively zoom in. That means panning, tilting, zooming, and controlling time. So you're controlling four dimensions at once. So that's odd. That's not really time lapse because you're interacting with it. You're actively going to control the playback of time and the perspective that you have within the playback. So we call it time machine instead because time machines have knobs and buttons. So it's a time machine. Now it's not any time machine, right? You can't use this time machine to go back to 1928. But you could start one of these time machines now in this room. And then an hour from now, you could come back an hour and super zoom in on whatever you want and look at that and play that back. So they're time machines that you start, not time machines that let you go anywhere you want. Now if you start thinking about what this time machine buys you in science, how does it change the way you do science, I get kind of excited. First of all, there's the question of extremal time scales. As you all know from watching things like planet Earth, our human ability to understand, comprehend time and to understand natural processes is more or less evolutionary clamped to our understanding of time. When we watch a mushroom growing fast, when we watch six months in two minutes, it changes our conception of that six month process, right? But we need to see it in two minutes. We can't just watch it for six months. That doesn't work. That's called watching grass grow. So when you compress time, when you go to an extremal time scale where you take the very long term and make it short, it changes our understanding of long term phenomena. And this applies to geology. This is why James Baylog's glaciation videos are fantastic because they flow like a river. It's a glacier, right? That's why uh, Koyan and Iskati's videos of clouds rolling over a mountaintop work so beautifully because you start to think of clouds in terms of fluid dynamics. And until that moment, it's hard to think of clouds in terms of fluid dynamics. And it works for Edgerton, right? It works for a drop of milk falling in a glass of milk because the structure of the bubbles that you see changes your intuitive <coughs> habituation to the physics of that water. Sorry, I'm stuck on aqueous systems right now. But take, away, take away from that what you may. Maybe I'm thirsty. So extremal time scales are one example where you get to do novel science. But then there's another one which you get with the gigapixel concept. Extreme spatial scales, dynamically spatial scales. What if you can look at the whole universe's creation? What if you can look at a microscopic event and slow down and speed up time? Again, in both of those cases and cross product those with the extreme time scales, in both representations of time, you're gonna reach really interesting science. So here's my kind of takeaway from this. My takeaway from this is this can change the attitude we have as science collectors and science interpreters. In science, as I said earlier, you're deciding what to pay attention to. You're a wetland ecologist. Your job is to decide which wetland you're gonna spend the next two months studying. <coughs> then you're gonna go there and study it, and you're gonna decide what in that wetland to study for the next two months. But what if I told you, you have the money to make 10 time machines? Now your job is to say, okay, what are the most interesting 10 standing set representations of wetlands in the world? Maybe the ones that are endangered, the ones that are doing fine, and the ones in, in climates that are extremal. When should I start 10 time machines in 10 wetlands? That's now your job in science. Your job is no longer to decide ahead of time and commit yourself to a single area of inquiry or a single spatial area of inquiry. Instead, your job is to collect so much data that you can, after the fact, look for, in a comparative manner, all manner of characteristics within all that data. So to me, that's really cool because that's exhaustive, right? You become an exhaustive technician. And in so doing, it's kind of big data meeting spatiotemporal exploration. 
So that to me is the takeaway that I have from this talk is this concept that maybe we can have science in some aspects of science start thinking exhaustively, comprehensively, if you will. I'll give you one more example and then show you the uh, demos, which are, let's say we're talking about geomorphologists who study volcanoes. Today you have kinetic models and dynamic models of how a volcano erupts. But what if you took the top 20 volcanoes in the world, set up time machines at all of them now, you're gonna capture an eruption of a real volcano with millimeter scale resolution. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that you can actually check your math <laughs> in a way that isn't possible today because we're never there with the right equipment at the right time to do so. Now, there's big problems to solve and if you think of everything that I talked about solving for gigapans, for gigapixel imagery, it's harder <laughs> now, much harder. First of all, the capture problem is much harder because of course we wanna be able to do this on multiple time scales. And this equipment just won't do it for something that runs for about a second, right? You can't capture 100 images in one second with this. But of course, for many, many other timescales, this will work. For things that happen over the course of a day or a month or a year, this will work fine. And so the pro unit here has new firmware in it that allows you to program it to repeatedly take the same gigapan with time intervals in between. So that allows you to capture basic content in. But the post-processing isn't just stitching anymore. You see, I, I, I up-leveled us from stitching to post-processing. Well, there's a reason for that. In stitching world, we have our set of adjacent images and we're simply trying to make one seamless view of the whole thing. But now things are much more complex. First of all, you have a stack of images. So you have a co-registration problem across this stack. Second of all, adjacent images in that stack could be apart, right? They could be one week or one day apart. Lighting conditions could be dramatically different. And what's worse, on top of all that, the reason you're doing a time lapse is because things are happening there, right? So there's motion. <laughs> So you're trying to co-register two things where most of what's in the scene might be moving in between the co-registered scenes. So you have a real challenge on your hands in terms of the exposure control, in terms of the fact that you can't do singular exposure control on each picture, so you have to be able to deal with the higher dynamic ranges of exposure, in terms of the fact that things are moving, and they need to register all of it together if you have any chance of zooming in in a wormhole and exploring through time. Because if you don't co-register, you're gonna get massive jitter. It'll be impossible to track anything through time. Then there's a server problem. And again, the headache is only bigger, right? If, if the headache of regular gigapans is, how do we serve this multi-resolution image data out to people's computers without killing the internet? Here we say, okay, well, we have the same problem now, except the back end content is much deeper, right? Now you're talking about terapixels and terapixels of data from which you have to sample the right information to somebody's computer so that as they explore in, in pan and tilt and zoom and time speed, you're giving them all the right data to construct the right video on their screen. <laughs> so as you can imagine, that gets much harder. And then there's the actual interactive viewing and annotation. If annotation was important in gigapans, it's exponentially more important in a time machine. Why? Because in a gigapan, you're looking for particular things of interest in a single gigapan. But in a time machine, you have actually exponentially more possible things of interest to look at across four dimensions. Finding one and sharing it with your constituency is incredibly important. So you need to be able to identify a path through four dimensions that's interesting. You need to be able to identify that, annotate it, and then share it, essentially as a hyperlink, into the time machine. So those are all the challenges you have to solve. Now, um, I'm very pleased to say that we have a first version of this that I'll show you right now for the first time. Um, this is the part I'm gonna show you. And this is new, and it hasn't been released yet. So you'll know that it hasn't been released because you're gonna see uh, well, you're gonna see Lorem Ipsum. So if you see Lorem Ipsum, you know it isn't live yet. So this is Gigapan time-lapse. The general idea here is it's a sampling of five different examples of content that we've, we have exemplified this concept with. I'm gonna just tour you through them and show you some of the features and some of what I think is exciting about this concept. Here we have uh, pictures that were taken for us by, um, let's see if her name is here, Janet. Help me out, Janet. Stevens. Janet Stevens is a professor um, at University of Wisconsin. And it's brassica is the name of the uh, plant species here. What's interesting about this is, first of all, of course I can just play this video and you'll see plants growing. So this is a one month long time machine, okay? It's a single month and it's got quite a lot of resolution. So in fact, you can, you can do a good job of zooming into this and seeing really interesting details. And you know, you'll start to see some fun stuff, right? The fact that they're moving. <laughs> makes them seem alive. It shows you something about plant behavior that's hard to see if you just water your plant every day. But let me stop that and place some of her, uh, some of her little wormholes through this. Now we need a name for that. Right? What is it called? 
when you have a time machine and you have a wormhole, a uh, one-dimensional sort of wormhole through four dimensions, well, let's call that a time warp, of course, since we need a name for it, right? So I'll show you some examples. Um, here's a fun one. Plants correcting their growth. And she writes all about this on here. So she's annotated beautifully the concept of what's happening here. But here, the idea that she's talking about is that what's interesting about plants is how they recover when they fall. So you can see she's panning and tilting, and she's gone to a certain zoom level, and she's moving around. And so you get to watch what happens as plants fall over and die in some cases, and in some cases come back to life. And what's cool is that pretty soon she'll actually pan left to another plant that falls over quite a lot. Look at how it curves. It's just a gorgeous little image. Look at that. It shows you the plant's motion. It shows you how that plant compensates against gravity in a totally different regime than what you're used to, right? In a biology class, you can imagine how pow powerful this would be to teach people about plants, about cotyledons, and about, about circumnavigation that plants have. Another great example I'll show you is reproduction. Here, she zooms in to flowers. Now, these are flowering plants, but there's no, there's no bees here. But they pollinate because they bang against each other a few times. So the very fact that they're shaking means they hit each other. And so you get some simple pollination. So you're going to start to see fruit growing. See the little pea pods growing? I'll just point at it with my mouse. See it right here? So that grew out of the flower. And you're watching the entire thing happen in 28 days. So again, you're watching pollination, in this case quasi-autopollination, between different plants in the same plant pot. And then you're watching the, the fruit grow. This is really beautiful. I'll show you one last one that's just absolutely fun. Caterpillars. She uh, put a little white sticky on there with caterpillar eggs. And they gave birth, and they started eating the leaf. And so you get to see the manner in which the leaf is ingested by the caterpillars and basically disappears. And then it gets better, because the caterpillars are growing big now. So now you start to see the caterpillars themselves. You see them going up and down that stem. And what are they eating? They're eating the poor flower buds. And it's not just the buds, folks. They're going to eat the entire stalk. No more stalk. <laughs> so you get to see the process by which the caterpillars attack the plant. Again, in terms of biological and plant processes, this is remarkable. And that was all two or three small little time warps inside this. There's more, right? There are stink bugs that walk around. There's all sorts of other biological effects that you can find. Now, that's one scale. I want to go to a very different scale, because remember I said spatial extrema to me, scalar extrema are really interesting, and temporal extrema. So here you're looking at 200 million light years, and we're going to play through 6 billion light years. It's the first 6 billion, sorry, 6 billion years. It's the first 6 billion years of the universe across the 200 million light year frame. Supercomputing simulated of 240 million particles, including dark matter. And what you see happening in space is beautiful. You see kind of reification of the structures of space that yield solar systems, and galaxies. Sorry, not solar systems, galaxies. I don't know what I'm smoking. And it's got extreme resolution. So you can go in and see individual units, which turn out to be individual galaxies and galaxy clusters. So there's a galaxy cluster right there. So this gives you a different kind of visualization, because now you can play that. You can play backwards. You can play forwards. I guess I should hit play. But the point is that you can zoom in and do these kinds of games in real time. So we can see individual formations of uh, essentially lines of, of lines of gravity between galaxies here. I'll show you another example that's not a month, but rather a week. This is Carnival. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Carnival here at Carnegie Mellon. The fraternities build big structures in the parking lot. In fact, they've started building them today. So you can go and start to see this building process going. What's interesting about this is it's humanity, right? It's, it's human construction. In this case, it's a parking lot. It becomes nighttime. We can start to zoom in. And remember, this is all happening dynamically, right? I, with the mouse here, I'm deciding where to go and what to look at. I can slide forward some and see what this building ends up looking like. And then I can see people milling about enjoying the carnival. And then I can even go and watch it being torn down. So I can go here on this one, let's say. And the end of the event, they'll remove it. Actually, this is still the event, isn't it? There's people milling around still. So there's the final night. OK, looks to me like they're removing it now. Yep. Is that a week, Neil? This is a week. Yeah. 
Is there one today, teachers? 15 minutes. And so now it's a parking lot, and of course it does what parking lots do. It fills up with cars at the end. And oh, then they go home. So that's a whole day of parking after the, the event is done. Again, the amount of information that can be studied in this image is, as you can imagine, tremendous, right? We still haven't found all the things that can be opportunistically found in this. Because you have gigapixel level information across time, every 15 minutes for, for a week. So you have an incredible ability to imagine explorations and discoveries within that information space. So that's a different kind of scale. And then this last example is interesting because as you can imagine with that solar, with that solar uh, demonstration I showed you, that's not from a GPAN capture unit, right? We don't have one yet that can capture 200 million light years across six billion years ago. That's a joke. It's a simulation done on the supercomputing center here. This one is also not with a gigapixel time, time lapse unit of any kind, a gigapan time lapse unit. This is the National Institutes of Health's uh, human body, physical body project, where they took a human body, a cadaver that was donated, and sliced it, and took optical images of each slice. So here, the time dimension isn't actually a time dimension at all. It's a Z dimension. It's the time dimension of when they optically sliced the body. And what's interesting about this is that you can now go in, I should make this large, and you can see the brain, and then you can follow the brain stem down as we go into the main body. And there we are, there's the brain stem, the, essentially the spine near the end of its travels where we have you know, legs and arms, or hips and arms, I guess I should say. And so again, this presents a sort of MRI view-like ability to explore, in this case, through the Z dimension of the human body while looking at a great amount of detail in that axis. So that's an example of specific time warps through time machines that you can either set up with existing simulated information, with existing physical data content, or with uh, captured data that you can decide to capture. And we're capturing more data now, of course, as you can imagine. What's interesting about all this, get out of that. What's interesting about all this is to think about the next steps. And I'll close with some thoughts about the future. Because as we start thinking about this idea of seeding time machines and making time warps all over the place, the problem I'm going to have talking about with this with you all is half of you are probably stuck like I would be thinking about Star Trek because I said the word time warp. So to get that out of your brain, I'll just show you a picture of the Enterprise so we can overcome that mental block and then we'll put that aside and talk about the future. Um, so, so hopefully that got you back in gigapan land. So first of all, there's a content question, right? How do we enable the most possible number of people to author time machine content around the world? It's an interesting question because it's right now a, a labor of love. As you can imagine, even using a gigapan, you have to really love it to take care of the gigapan, to feed it daily and ensure that all goes well over the course of the year or the six months or the one week that you wish to get a, gig, get a gig, uh, gigapixel time image for. And we're gonna make a blog and wiki that we're going to post soon to try and teach people how to do this to some degree. But it's a very fascinating question because as you well know also, there's higher resolution cameras coming out, there's higher resolution video cameras coming out. And so it's entirely conceivable that in three or four years you can buy a Sony digital camera that's way beyond HD that gives you 30 or 40 megapixels per frame at frame rate. And then already there is a need for interactive exploration and annotation of these time warps inside the spaces created by that device. So there's already a really interesting direction to go there. Then there's a question of viewership. We have to be able to publicly release the products that allow the public to view these, that allow scientists to annotate and share those annotations with the public to create a better sense of understanding about the science that's being done, about the content itself. So that we expect will be very popular. And we're very pleased to be in the midst of releasing that so that anybody can take their content, post it, and have the public able to interactively view it in time and space this way and then annotate it with new time works. Then there's research. And this is the part where I'm actually advertising greedily to you all. There's far more research here that could be even conceived of in our group. So we need researchers around the world to imagine this stuff and work on it. And they already are, of course. There's much, much research in these areas. But boy, would we love to collaborate with anybody on this. There's issues having to do with advanced post-processing, right? You're going to want to be able to do micro time lapses, macro time machines, where focus stacking is going to become incredibly important. So you're going to want much more sophisticated technologies for creating imagery that's either focus stacked or three-dimensional and being able to do everything we're talking about in three dimensions or across essentially pinhole apertures. Then there's a the question of image understanding applied to space time. 
there's a ton of information in these. Just dealing with foreground background extraction is an important part of making the registration process possible. But there's much more to do in terms of tracking objects. If you can track individual objects, then you can take the blossom and essentially track the blossom over time as it blooms into a flower. So you can do the pan tilting and zooming autonomously and tell somebody, look at that and look at this and keep those in view. Now play time for me. And you can have really fascinating ways to overlay different time machines on top of each other or autonomously or semi-autonomously control the perspective that you have on a single time machine, which I think are really interesting problems to deal with. Then there's a the question of capture control. You ideally would love to be able to have autonomous capture controls where you can actually look for interesting things happening and at that point in time speed up the temporal resolution of your time lapse. Slow it down when no interesting things aren't happening. So there's so much room there to do enough image understanding that you can capture essentially the effective bit rate you have is massive because you're able to compress real time by sampling less when there's less interesting things happening. And then there's the question of time warp control, right? Autonomously guiding an exploration through a space to look at the parts that are interesting, high resolution and such. So there's a ton of research to do in this field. What excites me is the idea that thinking about this in view of public understanding of science and public participation in research in science <coughs> yields very fertile ground for us as researchers to explore the space. Because we can create and surface technologies that the scientists can use today. It changes how they do science. And it can change the way the public view science. And perhaps that's ecologically and socially powerful in changing human behavior. And that would be a really nice result. So with that uh, view of, uh, optimistic view of the future, um, let me acknowledge the GigiPan team, the edu education team. GigiPan Systems makes this possible through all their work actually fabricating this stuff in Portland, Oregon the robots and sending it out to people who need it. And then of course the time machine team, which Randy led with Chris, Paul, and Yanni, and the team that creates the GigiPan hardware. Last, these are the funders that made the whole thing possible. So these are the groups that have given us either cash gift donations or in-kind donations. Um, this whole project is run entirely by gift money, believe it or not, so there's no contracts. And it's their gifts that make it possible for us to reach out to scientists without having barriers on IP or any other kinds of constraints to show. Thank you for your attention. That's a very good question. We need to do that for GigaPan even, because even in the GigaPan case, we know the, geo uh, the geographic coordinates of the places, and we want to be able to tr transition between them. So we have not worked on that yet. But I would love to see somebody work on that, both for the fixed time elements and for the space time elements. You can even imagine transitioning through space and time simultaneously to change perspective. And when we can get the capture hardware to be even cheaper and faster, using, let's say, a single camera and no robot, if people with specialized lenses on a camera that still gives you high resolution, then yeah, you can imagine a plant scene where you have five cameras and you do a kind of Tikio Kanade thing where you can shift perspectives interpolating through space while advancing through time. That would be fabulous. I like it. <laughs> yes. So uh, since you're taking a bunch of images anyway, yeah. do, you, do you know how hard it would be to create a stereoscopic or 3D bigger pants or you wear glasses and you perceive? So there are people who are doing uh, anglyphs in the pants space right now. And often they're doing it by taking a picture from here and then moving the tripod over, or they make a bracket and not two cameras on the system at the same time. We haven't tried that for time lapse yet. And you know, when you zoom, you really want to be smart. Uh, to, to zoom and do it right, you need to be able to change the baseline. So doing three dimensions right with zoom, changing baseline so that people don't get a headache, and then playing with time, I would love to see that happen. It, all it adds is more data, which means, you know, people used to say data is free, ha ha ha, memory is free. And I used to say this all the time, and then we got into the GigaPan world. And unfortunately, no, memory's not free. I just say that, but it's actually expensive when you need enough memory. So we have to fundraise to get there. <laughs> So it's interesting, our perspective on public authorship changes our relationship to the data a little bit. The uh, data on GigaPan's website is not owned by us. In fact, the copyright information on GigaPan's website is that the author of the picture, they own the picture. And they can delete it at will at any time. In fact, we had a beautiful picture of Dubai 
deleted by the author because he decided to go off the internet. It's gone. So it's interesting because by saying we're simply hosting and not taking the pictures, we're not a professional purveyor of content in the way that Google was with Street View. That, I think, helps. But it's absolutely possible for somebody to come along with any of these technologies and invade somebody else's privacy. Today, we haven't had major problems with this because reasonable person principle has worked. For instance, when people advertise on GigaPad, so far, we've been able to write emails to them, ask them to please stop, and they stop. So literally, we've been doing human communication. And maybe that's a, a, nice, a nice thing to say. So far, normal human communication wins. <laughs> but indeed, one day, this can always be a problem. Um, in, in fact, with the uh, carnival picture, we had to go to the fraternities and get their permission to show that. Because it's showing hundreds of members of the, of the fraternities building these things over time. And we want them to be aware of that before we show it to you. Our retina resolves uh, with different resolutions. Like the film we are resolved better than the periphery. Yes. But all the standard displays have uniform resolution. Do you see any value in running either software or hardware that accommodates the resolution distribution at all? It's funny. Uh, the active foveation, which we do in the physical world, the way we mimic that, let's say, with the GigaPan viewer, is that we pan and tilt the picture around. So our hand becomes our fovea foveation device. Um, it would be interesting to imagine our hand not being the foveation device and doing something more sophisticated with a head mounted display and a display that's dynamically resolved. Um, I don't know the properties of such a display. You know, What I don't want to do is pay the price at the periphery for more of the res of in the center. What I'd rather do is spend more money on the center, but save money by not spending that more money. <laughs> on the periphery. So perhaps there's something there. Uh, what I have done that's kind of interesting is you can take a print out of the gigapad and loop it around your body, physically, a piece of paper, and put yourself inside the cylinder. And the experience you have being inside that cylinder with a physical printed gigapad, looking around with your head motion, feels completely different, totally different from having that same print on the wall and totally different from having that same print on the computer. And so it's clear to me that the proprioceptive controls we have for neck motion, eye motion, embody complete differences in experientiality that we have for these different presentational methods to our body. And I don't think that's been explored enough, but I did have one experiment, and it was stunningly different. Uh, by the way, the piece of paper around my head was better than everything else. It was superior to the internet, it was superior to the wall computer. It's just hard to put in a gallery. So today that works, because the server infrastructure we've set up at Carnegie Mellon can, in parallel, serve multiple spatiotemporal resolutions to multiple viewers simultaneously. But the way we're doing that is sort of oversampling, right? We have the data in many different resolution and temporal formats on the server side, side here. So we can serve it to you the minute of the front end computation, back end computation. We've done it all in front, basically. And I think that's the answer is essentially smart caching, right? Create as much data as you can so the real time computational demand is low on your server.